Welcome to The Remedy, I'm Jamal Simmons. Today we are talking about race and politics. Here with us is author and law professor Ian Haney Lopez, who just finished his second book, Merge Left, which discusses the neutralization of racial division. Also joining us is director for the Muslim Public Affairs Council and Google Next Gen policy leader, Hoda Hawa, who writes on issues that affect marginalized communities. Ian, I'm gonna give you the floor to get us started because you wrote this book and I wanna hear from you in your own words why you wrote it and what the fundamental point is you wanted to make. So let's start with the good news. There is a way to bring people together that addresses racism and also build support for progressive policies that we all need for um, uh, livable wage, for, for health care, for child care, uh, to get government on the side of really trying to avert climate collapse. There is a way to both address racial division and solve these big problems. And the key is to do both, to fuse them. But to understand why this is the key, we also have to understand where we are and what's happening to us. In effect, for the last 50 years, we're living what Donald Trump symbolizes today. He symbolizes a billionaire who uses racial division to convince people to fear black and brown people while he turns around and enacts policies that are good for billionaires. It's just that He's symbolic of a structural pattern that's been going on for 50 years. The solution is to name that tactic, to say, hey, racial division is a weapon of the corporations and dynastic wealth against all of us. And when we reject racial division and come together, that's when we can have the good things we all deserve. Who are you talking to? in this book. Who's the audience here that you really want to listen to this message? Okay, so, so we got to do this on two levels. I am talking to engaged progressives who say we need a society in which government actually works for people. And in working for people, that includes both economically, but also in terms of human rights, a government that helps everybody thrive, not a government engaged in mass surveillance, mass deportation, mass incarceration. I'm talking to engaged progressives. But what engaged progressives want to hear is, how do we talk to the country as a whole? So I did this big two-year research project with a lot of other folks, and we have a lot of good data on how you talk to the country as a whole, and on the power of a message that says, when we reject a vision, come together across race lines, then we can elect people who take care of all of us, black, brown, and white. That message works for 60, 70% of the population. All right, so sometimes when, I'm, when I read a little bit about this and when I listen, I wonder, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, if when we say talking to the country at large, it's a euphemism for white people. Hell yes, we need to talk to white people. There's so much power there and so much fear there. We're not gonna build the country we want without coming into alliance, bringing whites in, having, having them feel like there's space. Here's what we cannot do and what, to be honest, what Democrats very often do appeal to whites in a way that sacrifices people of color. Okay, Hoda, what do you hear when you hear this? What are you thinking? No, I, uh, I agree with much of, of what you said. I would say that the problem of racism is not necessarily just with the economic status of various classes. I mean, I don't think that we have time to talk about the history of this country, <laughs> but we can start from there, that the history of this country really was built on institutional, uh, I mean, it was built on, on the backs of slaves and uh, of enslaved people, and, and the institutions that are held up today are held up in order to ensure that vulnerable communities, including black and brown communities, really stay where they should Why? be staying. Why? There is, and, and so there even is, when you start with slavery, slavery is a perfect example of the dynamic I'm talking about. Big money, the planter class created the idea of white and black races in order to divide unfree labor from Europe and unfree labor from Africa. There's, there's also the power dynamic, and mm -hmm. I would, I, I mean, as much as we applaud this 116th Congress being the most diverse Congress, let's also be very real about the numbers. The Senate is still about 90% white. Mm -hmm. The House is still about 70% white. And when we're talking about the diversity of the members, that's great, and we want more of that. But when we talk about the inclusion of their ideas, their legislation, their policies, the folks who are being hired as staffers, there is an imbalance there, and that is the power imbalance that continues to maintain the institutions that were created when this nation was created. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I guess what I'm trying to say is, 
how do we make progress against that? How do we change that? And, and to, be, to be clear, and to, to, to give you a little bit of where I'm coming from, you know, I teach race and American law at UC Berkeley. I've taught there for 20 years. For most of that time, my perspective on racism was it's basically white folks and people of color and white folks exercising power through the institutions of law, legislatures, courts. And then I thought to myself, what is the solution? There's so much power there. All we can do is speak truth to that power. All we can do is condemn it. All we can do is call it out. And yet, a few years ago, I started thinking, thinking really, why, when there has been racial progress, do we have a society that is simultaneously electing and re-electing a black president, and yet engaged in mass incarceration, um, engaged in mass surveillance, demonizing Muslims, demonizing uh, immigrants from Central America as these refugee caravans? What is happening there? And, and what I came to realize is that this was racism as politics. That is, our politics for the last 50 years has been driven by the by the purposeful exploitation of racial fear and hatred. That has had disastrous consequences for people of color. Far worse than for whites, disastrous, okay, so here's, so but here's, so here's my question. how do we get past it? Here's my question for you. Um, are you talking about not talking about race in order to talk about class? Oh my gosh, that is exactly what I'm not doing, and it's, I'm so glad you said that, right? That's the disaster. And we hear over and over again from folks who say, hey, you know, what really brings us together is class, race divides us, let's not talk about it, good luck with that. Racism is the number one weapon used to divide working people from each other. We cannot move forward without addressing racism. The question is, how do we address racism? Do we address racism as white racism that we have to call out and name? You can do that, but understand that's going to have two consequences. One, white folks are going to feel like, I don't have a role in this. And two, you're going to demobilize most people of color. Activists love right. that message. Right. But when we and that's what I worry about. I worry about what happens to the people who want to hear an explicit message about race because they're feeling under the gun of some of the racial policy. And if we are encouraging Democrats or progressives to not talk about it, those communities will feel disempowered Absolutely. by everybody exactly. who's supposed to be an advocate. Exactly. Right. Well, I mean, I you deal, Hoda, you deal with a lot of um, a lot of questions, particularly now in the Muslim community as well. Who, when we talk about these questions, very often they're black-white questions. And then we start adding in other communities to the question, right. to, the, to the answers. Right. You know, I will say first that the American Muslim community here is the most diverse faith community mm -hmm. in the United States. The biggest community, obviously, being the African American Muslim community, and the fastest growing is the Latinx Muslim community. Um, and so we have, I think, a very unique role to play in this conversation. Uh, I will also say that we are in a very unique and incredible political and cultural moment where folks, both who are running for elected office, and civil society can take advantage of that opportunity to talk about these very issues. But it has to be a whole of society approach. It can't be folks on one side having these conversations in silos and activists mm -hmm. and civil society groups having the other conver you know, conversations on the other side. We need to come together. I think also that folks who are running for elected office need to also be willing to hear out from communities, from impacted communities mm -hmm. and vulnerable communities what it is that or how these issues and these policies are impacting their communities. Getting the framing and the messaging right from, from those impacted folks, I think, is going to be incredibly important. I mean, we see candidates on the stage progressive candidates and other Democratic candidates on, on the stage talking about issues, and we, we hear the same tired sort of framing of communities when it's about Muslims and we're securitizing Muslims and we're mm -hmm. only talking about national security. Mm -hmm. When you hear about the Latinx community, we're really only talking about immigration mm -hmm. policy. So I think candidates need to get beyond that and be more inclusive when it comes to building their campaign and including civil society. And here's what I wonder about. Think about my family in Detroit, Michigan, where I grew up. And I think there's so many people who, when they hear these questions, this is just not how they're processing the world, right? I mean, they're just thinking about trying to get, you know, somebody's mom into a you know, healthcare facility. They're dealing with their kids. They got their own health stuff. They're trying to get their schools to work. Their garbage picked up. And so, in some ways, they are not necessarily encountering racism very overtly in their day-to-day -day lives. So, how do we make this make sense to people who are living that way, who are probably going to end up being voters? Yeah. So. 
the message that I'm talking about, we actually ran a two-year research project with focus groups and with polling, and what we, what we were answering is, how do we do that? And you're exactly right. If you go in with a structural conversation, people have a hard time understanding it. If you go in with a, hey, we should all just get along, they don't believe it's gonna happen. What we found was a combination of divide and conquer, right? This is intentional division. People understand intentional division because they can see it at an individual level. We would hear back from people, intentional division, But you say intentional by who? You think about somebody like Donald Trump, but even more, the GOP. The GOP made the decision that they would intentionally divide Americans by stoking racial acrimony, and in the midst of that division, convince people to fear each other and to support a party that pretended to, per to protect one side. Okay, so that's political, but when you started off, you started talking about corporate power. Oh, yeah. It's very hard to explain to people this is what the corporations are doing. So if you say things like greedy politicians, they're dark money backers, they can see that. If it, you know, if you get a little bit more advanced in the conversation, you can start saying things like, look, how did the Koch brothers, one of the wealthiest families in America, through the petrochemical industry, how did they get what they wanted? They funded the Tea Party. What, did the, what was the Tea Party? It was a machine for, for organizing and stoking racial hate and fear. Right? Th that is, we're telling a story of intentional division, and people get intentional division. They, they've seen it in their own lives. That's one part of the story. And here's the other part of the story that is incredibly important, at least as important. We are calling for unity. We are calling for people coming together because people know what that means. People have a sense that we as a country are bitterly divided. They have a sense that the system is rigged, and they might not know which corporation, they might not know who the Koch brothers are. They have a sense that the system is rigged. So when we combine their dividing us so that they can rig the system, we need to get together so that we can make sure the system works for us. People intuitively grasp that message. In fact, they're already there intuitively, and all this is doing is crystallizing it and giving them a name for what's happening and a remedy for how to move forward. So Hoda, you represent a community that's a minority community in the country, um, a minority of minorities in, some, in many ways. Yeah. Um, coalition building has got to be a part of what you do. Yeah. So what are the messages and ways that you find to be effective in the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, coalition building is absolutely imperative in our work. I mean, if we want to ultimately influence members of Congress, folks in power, then we need to be able to go into a room, we need to be able to sit around a table and talk about issues that are impacting all Americans. And American Muslims just happen to be part, a community that is part of that fabric. Um, I would say that another, um, you know, when you talk about uh, informing citizens and mm -hmm. educating them on all of these issues and how racism is being mm -hmm. used to divide communities, I think really ultimately it's groups like MPAC and others that are working on encouraging civic engagement. Mm -hmm. We ultimately want to have an informed citizenry mm -hmm. when they go out to vote, right? Yes, it's very important. Folks are, are really concerned about the economy. They just want to get access to health care. They need access to all of these resources. And they may not be experiencing overt racism, but that doesn't mean that they're not experiencing it at all, sure. right? Yeah. So we want to be able to inform our citizens. We need active um, education campaigns, and we can only do that when we're working in coalition with other groups so that all communities are informed and we get that message out there. And obviously this isn't, um, you know, this is not just racial. There also has been a gender dynamic Absolutely. at stake and at play um, in American history. So how do you address that in your work? I think, I think m m through the same framework. So there's two levels that this is happening on. One is the level of the division that we're encountering in society and the struggle we're having to make sure that we're a society that really values the humanity of each member of, of our society. That's this big cultural fight we're having. Super important. But what we've lost sight of is there's a set of folks who are very, very powerful, who control huge megaphones, who actually benefit when they stoke division. That's not the only thing that's happening with division, and people are getting hurt in different ways, some much worse than others, but we can't lose sight of the fact that this is an intentional strategy. And, and I would go so far as to say, we can't understand some of the most severe forms of violence against particular communities without understanding the advantage that people have sought in doing so. And so I would say, mass incarceration in the African-American community. What is the root of that? Politicians campaigning for votes by scaring people with the lie that blacks are inherently criminal. 
or I would say the, the sort of attacks on Muslim Americans. What is the root of that? Politicians score points with voters by convincing them that Sharia is coming to Kansas. Is Sharia coming to Kansas? No, it's not. But and, and, and so there's tremendous damage and demonization, dehumanization, families shattered, and it's all political theater. Okay, so we have will, to will, call will, that out. I will, yes, I totally agree that part mm -hmm. of that is political theater. Mm -hmm. I will also say that it's representation. And so we need to continue to work with folks who do ho have that platform, both in Hollywood and the entertainment industry mm -hmm. and other media outlets to ensure that, the, that those aren't the only images that are coming on screen. Because members of Congress, folks who are running um, for elected office, they're consuming the same popular culture as the average American. And so if, that, if those images and representation is informed Informing the way that they think about communities and think right. about people, ultimately right. that's informing the way that they're writing their policies. Right. So okay. So this gets to the question I was about to ask, which is, who's doing this well? Who are the? Where are the examples that we have of uh, some group of people in America who are making, who are having the conversation that ought to be had? This new conversation that we're having the new now. New conversation that you're prescribing. I think we're doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, this is an insurgent. Are there any politicians who are doing this? I think that there are certain politicians. Elizabeth Warren, for example, every so often really does this very well. She says, what, what you see from Donald Trump is an intentional effort to, to divide us, white from black, gay and straight, men and women. And when they divide us, that's when they can laugh all the way to the bank. Every so often she does this. But I would say this. This is an insurgent message, and, and we all need to sort of take our part. And I actually want to come back to something you said and connect it. You said civic engagement, and I could not agree more. I just want to take it one more step. It's not just that we want to educate people. We want to build social solidarity. We want to build a sense that we really are in this together and that we really are. We share our humanity. We share our dreams. We share our aspirations and that we'll get there together. And the reason it's so important to purposefully build social solidarity is because the other side, the, the Fox News, the Mercers, the Kochs, the Trumps, they have spent 50 years tearing social solidarity apart. And now, who's doing it well in terms of building social solidarity? I have some bad news there. The general left gave up on the idea of social solidarity when they gave up on the idea of integration. We, we have lots of people who are saying, we're going to address this problem, we're going to address that problem, we're going to increase this representation for this group. But we have very few groups who say our defining mission is to make sure that we see each other in the smiles of people who have different skin colors or unfamiliar surnames, worship different gods, different sexualities. We, we, we have to have social solidarity as a north star for what we're trying to do. And I think that's going to come from people like us saying, that's what we want to hear. I think you know we're missing an incredible asset if we continue to put the onus and the responsibility on people in traditional power, and that we mm -hmm. don't also give that responsibility to the people, to American citizens. Because I think that this conversation is actually happening at the local level throughout and across America. You know, we may not be hearing at, uh, hearing about it on the national level, but I think that it is happening, and I think that there is change coming. Because, like I said, we are in an, a political and a cultural moment where you know folks are being held accountable and I don't think that the majority of Americans are going to let what's happening right now well, I continue. You, I see, yeah I see one thing that happens that is um, that is encouraging to me and it makes me always think that those of us who are in politics and social advocacy might need to get out a little bit more and talk to other people yeah. is when you watch commercials on television when you look at the advertising that corporations the largest corporations uh -huh. in the world uh -huh. are putting on television right. the random acts of integration right. <laughs> that exist yeah. in these advertisements right. there'll be you know a couple of guys raising a the kid there'll right. be you know a mixed race couple that's you know going to the beach yeah. you know there's all these things that are happening in advertising now corporations are not social leaders when it comes to this. They're right. doing this because right. they obviously think there's some part of the population that's open to this and responsive, so, right? Absolutely. And I, think, and I think that there are also faith leaders that not only are emerging, but have been around and played a role. We have leaders like Reverend William Barber, mm -hmm. who is a moral leader, who is ensuring that faith is being discussed when we're talking about mm -hmm. the progressive movement and when we're talking about making America a place where we all envision all of us being equal, right? So I think that this conversation, again, is 
is already happening. And you have leaders like Reverend Barber and others who are signaling to those leaders in you know non-traditional spaces that it's okay to act. It's not going to hurt your bottom line. In yeah. fact, it'll only enhance your bottom line because people are craving that. Yeah, I, I would say that that's right. That we're, we're, you talked about a lack of white aversion to some of these racial messages. That there, that there, there may be more acceptance among white people than we think of. Much more. This is something that I did not know. As someone who studied race for years and years and years, most people, when I say most people, I don't just mean most whites. Most people, including the majority of African Americans and the majority of Latinx, bounce back and forth between ideas that are basically rooted in racist stereotypes about black and brown people and racially egalitarian ideals of coming together. Most people are going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know this. I, I thought people of color are progressive. Right, the racists are white over are here. Racist, the the right? white and, progressives are over yeah, there. Yeah, and you know, that's not how the world works. The people are actually, most people are bouncing between both. And what's happening is we've got a message from, let's say, Fox News that says, organize your life in terms of your racist fears and your stereotypes. That will keep you safe. What we need is a message from the rest of us saying, be your best self. That's how you're going to take care of your family. And you can't believe how many people are out there already, whites and people of color, saying, I really do want to come together across race lines. I really do want a country in which we value the humanity of everybody. I really do want to have friends who have different skin colors than me. Now, they, they, uh, yeah, are they plagued by racist stereotypes? You bet. But we don't have to tear all that down. We just have to show how their, how their ideals will carry their family and all the rest of us forward as well.